Welcome to everybody. Um, we're very happy to see and um, know you are there. Um, uh, my name is Joke de Wolf. I'm a chairperson of uh, ICANN Netherlands, and I'm also a member of um, the Fellowship Fund Committee and uh, one of the organizers of this webinar. Um, the other organizing parties are ICA, ICA Germany and ICA Lithuania, and we're all part of the ICA International, the International uh, Association of Art Critics. And um, well, I think we have a very nice and wonderful rich program with uh, both academic and artists who are will be talking about um, ruptured histories, the streets, dynamic decolonization of, by the people. I will just do a very short introduction now about the planning and the schedule, and um, then um, we can start. Um, so first we have um, an introduction by Karen von Vey, and then um, the, the chair of the um, uh, FFC, the Fellowship Fund Committee. Um, then our two keynote speakers will have a longer presentation, um, Brenda Schmaman, uh, Professor Brenda Schmaman and um, the artist uh, Christina Norman. And then both uh, Alexander Koch and Dimitri Vilensky will um, share their, their responses. And afterwards, the floor is open to all of you to have uh, comments and questions and, and so forth. Um, uh, so for now, I will just um, uh, do a very short introduction of uh, Karen von Vee, who is the chair of the Fellowship Fund Committee and Professor uh, Emerita at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, of the visual arts department. So, yes. thank you. Can you see me? Yeah. Thanks very much, Yoka. Um, good day, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm just going to give you a very quick context for this webinar. Um, we in the Fellowship Fund Committee are tasked with, and I'm quoting now from our mission st statement enhancing the critical understanding of themes which are central and time-related among ICA members and beyond. So we function as a form of um, outreach for ICA, contributing to synergies of different perceptions of art criticism. And to achieve this goal, we organize forums and encounters in different parts of the world with a special focus on opening up a transcultural art discourse particularly in countries where art criticism is still evolving. Since COVID, the world has, of course, changed, but a positive result of the pandemic was the switch to electronic communication. And suddenly we had worldwide access to different cultures who could now freely participate in important cultural discussions that might previously have been financially or practically impossible. We've already organized two very successful webinar series under the heading Ruptured Histories, Critical Exchanges on Issues of Decolonization. The first was held in September 2021, entitled Decolonization in the Museum, Interrogating the History of Slavery. The second was held in a hybrid format, that's in person and online, at the Karachi Biennale in 2022. So this is the third of the ruptured, ruptured histories webinars, and we're planning more, all aimed at promoting intercultural dialogue that reflects the ongoing concerns of this new era of global art discourse. I, I'd like to end this very short introduction with a word of thanks to my hardworking, globally diverse FFC team, who really have worked very hard, and those at ICA, who've helped us put this webinar together. Um, and of course, thanks a lot to the speakers who've spent time and energy preparing for this presentation. I hope you all enjoy today's discussion and please join us for the next one. Thanks everyone. Well, thank you, uh, Karen. Um, we will, uh, afterwards, after the talk of Christina Norman, we'll have time for questioning and um, if you have in the meantime have questions you can also already write them down on the uh in the chat if you 
well, are afraid to lose your, your question uh, in the meantime. So now I will introduce the next speaker. Um, it's uh, Christina Norman, an artist born in Estonia. She's an artist host whose interdisciplinary works includes video installations, sculpture, and projects in the city space, as well as documentaries and performance. She is interested in the issues of collective memory and forgetting the memorial uses of the public space, but also the subtle sphere of the body politics that transgresses the boundaries between the public and the private. In 2022, Norman represented Estonia at the 59th Venice Biennale with an eco-critical exhibition, Orchidelium, or Cadelirium, An Appetite for Abundance, a duo show with Bita Razavi, and uh, Norman's experimental fil film trilogy commissioned for the Estonian Pavilion offers multiple ways to reflect on the legacies of colonialism from a specific Eastern European perspective. Um, today she will talk about After War, um, which she also represented um, in the um, uh, Venice Biennale in 2009. In her talk, Norman will speak about the gene genealogy of the project and its effects on her following practice. Thank you very much. And giving the floor to Christina, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Jokke, uh, for the introduction and also for the um, invitation uh, to be part of today's event. I will try to uh, share my screen right now. After War uh, is a research project which I carried out in uh, 2009 and it included a public intervention uh, which in Estonian society was received as a political provocation. Still uh, scandalously it represented Estonia at the Venice Biennial that year. Uh, my project uh, dealt with the aftermath of the relocation of the so-called Bronze Soldier Monument two years earlier in uh, 2007. The sculpture of a Red Army soldier had been erected in 1947 in the center of the Soviet-occupied Tallinn. It marked the grave of a dozen of men buried as war heroes fallen during what was presented by the Soviet regime as the, liber as the liberation of Tallinn from German occupiers in uh, 1944. The statue became the focal point of tension regarding Estonian independence. Estonian nationalists viewed it as a symbol of occupation and repression. For Russian-speaking Estonians, it celebrated the victory over Nazi Germany. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the majority of uh, Soviet symbols were removed uh, from uh, public space in Estonia. So the Bronze Soldier Monument became the main signifier of uh, Russian identity in Estonia. Throughout almost uh, 30 years of national independence, um, many Estonians found it hard to understand the reasons why local Russians would need to venerate the statue. Some saw the 9th of May Victory Day celebrations in front of the monument as a mockery of Estonian sovereignty. Especially so after Putin's speech in uh, 2005, where he declared that the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century and called for the, di for the diaspora Russians to unite around the idea of the great victory of the Soviet Union over Nazism. As we all know, today Russia justifies its invasion of Ukraine by the need to denazify the country. In 2007, 
the growing tension around the monument was used by the political technologists of the Estonian neoliberal party of reforms as a tool for crafting their victory at the parliamentary elections. They promised that the monument and its Russian speaking public would be moved from the city center if they won the election. I will show you the three main uh, spatial views of the Brown Soldier Monument. So this is the monument in its original location in the center of Tallinn on Tenisma Hill. This is the hill without the monument. And the monument at the defense um, cemetery in the, um, uh, not far from the original location, but still in a marginal place. In late April 2007, just two weeks before the coming Victory Day celebration, the government ordered the grave to be dug open and the statue with the bones moved to the Defence Forces Cemetery, two and a half kilometres away. This symbolic act of marginalisation and quite obviously desecration was followed by two nights of rioting in the streets of Tallinn. International news coverage of the event was very intense, with Russian propaganda channels exploding with Nazi rhetoric and declaring Estonia to be Russia's greatest enemy. In the Western media, Estonian authorities insisted on the success of the police operation to quell the protests. Regardless of the fact that there had only been a small fraction of the diaspora Russians rioting on the streets, the entire community was portrayed as having shown their real face. A criminal, violent people with no real values or true beliefs. Uh, this is the image um, uh, which was used by the main daily newspaper Postimes to portray the Russian community. The former location of the monument was declared a usual park with nothing special to see, just trees and low shrubs. Still, the 9th of May of 2008, uh, one year after the relocation of the monument, saw thousands of Russian people bringing flowers to the monument um, and uh, to the monument in its new location. And the empty ground of the former site in the city center. As usual, the Russian celebrations and the strange practices of commemoration were ridiculed in the Estonian media. Uh, one more year later, in, uh, on the 9th of May, um, 2009, uh, I installed a life-size a uh, golden replica of the monument in its original location. It was clear that the space had retained its loaded status in the years that it remained empty. My intention was to address the gut feeling that the government's victory over the monument was dubious and uncertain. Moving the Soviet soldier monument in space wouldn't make the myth of Russia's victory in the Great Patriotic War disappear. The deep divisions between the two groups and their incompatible and mutually exclusive historical narratives were not eradicated through their relocation and continued to fester unaddressed. As you can see uh, from the documentation, uh, my golden statue was first greeted cheerfully by those who had gathered in the empty park to stick their red carnations in the ground. The appearance of my sculpture in the park immediately triggered the usual rituality associated with the original statue. All this could only last uh, for some 15 minutes though, because the police also reenacted the solution to the unwanted object 
which uh, had materialized two years earlier. I was taken into custody and uh, during a two week investigation, the police came under increasing pressure from the people who demanded that I be prosecuted for my irresponsible actions. While there were a few artists and other citizens who said something in support, I was receiving multiple death threats at the time. There were artists of both older and younger generations who volunteered to make an expert statement in the media, deeming my action a political provocation and not at all art. It was only later that the work was legitimized as art when the Kiasma Museum of Helsinki acquired the entire project for their collection. Experts in memory studies, such as Enek and Launes, have pointed out that uh, the narrative frames about history available to local Russians remained very narrow in post-Soviet Estonia. While Estonians based their national identity on the narrative of victimhood uh, from the Soviet occupation, only the role of occupiers was, re was reserved to the country's large Russian minority. The narrative of the Soviet victory over Nazism offered by Russia obviously provides a positive explanation for the diaspora's presence in Estonia. Experts also find it problematic that all the blame for the violence of the 20th century has been placed on the Soviet Union and that there has been no will to recognize that the violence which came from the outside infected the locals and penetrated the society further already with their help. Looking at the archival images of the Bronze Soldier Monument, we can find lots of evidence of collaborationism, starting from the fact that the monument was authored by Estonians, sculptor N. Rose and architect Arnold Alas. We also see Estonian men and women in national costume, performing Soviet rituals in front of the monument. Many Russians, just as their Estonian counterparts seen in these images, had their relatives repressed and killed during Stalinist regime of terror. These are the instances erased by Russia's founding myth of the great victory. There are also Estonian men and women in these images whose relatives were forcefully mobilized or volunteered into the Soviet or the Nazi German army during the Second World War. History needs to be decolonized from the domination of uh, white spots and erasures. And artists can be of help in uh, democratizing memory liberating it from the control of politicians and filling in the gaps. A coherent society is the strongest weapon to withstand the pressure in the circumstances of the information war and even the actual war. As we know, there are people from Russian speaking families today fighting for the national independence of Ukraine. Also, monuments can be liberated of their heavy bronze corporality and be proposed as floating signifiers, open to new interpretations, and maybe represent subject positions previously unimaginable. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Christina, for this beautiful talk. And again, a lot of images and um, ideas as well about how to deal with these monuments. Um, first uh, of all, we will go to the to respondents. Um, first, we will have um, Alexander Koch. He is um, a curator, author, a gallery owner, mediator and consultant. In 2007, he co-founded Gallery Koe in uh, Berlin and New Patrons, and he was recently elected chair of the International New Patrons Society. Both projects are ongoing. 
Since uh, 1998, he has been responsible for numerous exhibitions, publications, and events in favor of socially oriented art. Um, and, um, well, I will have the floor for Alexander now. Thank you, Jokers. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, even though I cannot see many of you. Um, so I will more respond to Brenda in the chat uh, I quickly exchanged with uh, Dimitri, who uh, knows Christina's work pretty well. So we will a little bit split our roles, uh, I think. Um, I'm not so sure what I can contribute. What I think is obvious and and quite interesting how many affection are produced by public sculptures. You know, the whole post-Soviet era is also full of examples where sculptures were taken away and then people were running out of the streets and saying, hey, what are you doing there? Yeah, And for a long time, people may think that public art is not so important, but in certain moment, it actually becomes clear how important it is. Uh, and what I perceive in the presentations also is that uh, what Brenda said, uh, we should not look at it as vandalism when sculptures is attacked. It's vandalism in the language of those in power, but I think it's creativity in the language of the people affected. It's, uh, it's a way to counter narrate, it's a way to, to make necessary corrections, and it's it's a struggle ground, it's a battleground, specifically for voices from the bottom. And this is, I think, where it really becomes interesting when we think about decolonization, because the more obvious dimension here are the symbols themselves, like the white male uh, bastard from the past that should really disappear from the from the public realm. Yeah? Uh, so it should be attacked. But another struggle that goes on is the decolonialization of resources, like critical resources. But uh, what I also find important is to consider um, the financial and the power resources available or not available to make these decolonial corrections or deconstructions. And I think this is where the art world often has a certain weakness and many blind spots, actually, that the, the critique being produced uh, is still being produced within conditions and arrangement that are part of the still colonial or even neo-colonial world, specifically when Berlin or London or Paris-based artists you know, articulate or produce, produce this critique. Yeah, with the resources that the West has stolen, for example, from the from, from the African continent. Yeah. Uh, so this is why I think the the issue uh, that we can see follow so clearly in Brenda's uh, great research and presentation. The issue is really about where do the people get a hand on correcting the narratives, and what resources do they make their own? Because typically they are not given. Yeah, the reason, like this whole thing, uh, as you could see in, in both presentations, is highly policed, highly policed. Yeah, more than we would maybe expect. Yeah, uh, including how how uh, fast police violence can be applied once it comes down to the the social dimension of certain objects in the public space. Yeah. And, and this is where the, the, the struggle coming from the bottom where citizens, people of all kinds who are affected or part of marginalized groups from the past or the present uh, kind of grasp their own resources like stealing noses. <laughs> um, but I think to go further with the development of a decolonial project in theory and in, in practice, uh, it's really, important to more closely look uh, how resources can be redistributed 
from from the top to the bottom can be made available for more communities. I think this is really crucial. Um, decolonization must also mean dehierarchization of decolonial critique. Yeah, so that those those voices and bodies that actually maybe want to and should run this critique most of all also have the possibility to do so yeah, because I think what we're looking is other exceptional cases where the pressure is so high in the feelings of some people you know that action suddenly takes place yeah or as Christina also kind of was tracking you know how suddenly the emotions really cook up but those are even though you could make a typology of these events they are kind of singular cases uh, but if I understood Brenda correctly and maybe that would be a little question to her um, if I understood Brenda correctly many of the highly problematic sculptures in South Africa they are still there yeah so there were singular attacks, corrections, critiques, whatever, changes, but not at all on a systemic level uh, and not in a great scale, which means that the, the, the old colonial narratives uh, are intact in the material way. Yeah? Uh, and I don't think that everybody agrees on that. It just shows how the old institutions are still in place. Um, I don't know, Brenda, just, are you there? Do you want to maybe quickly react on that? Yeah, I'm happy to talk to that now if it suits you. Um, in fact, legislatively, um, South Africa is bound by a particular heritage policy where basically the policy is non-removal. It was an idea that emanated in 1994 from the idea that you would get a multicultural democracy. So that when the policy officially arose in 1999, it was following a pattern where instead of removing objects, you would replace or you would include new objects alongside old ones. What I think is happening now is a certain dissatisfaction with that policy. It's playing out many years after the fact. So I think that's the reason they're not removed, because there needs to be very sustained motivation and processes for removal. Um, but there's obviously popular unhappiness with the objects in question. And I think some of that spilled out with the rightness for movement. Um, but it's, it's playing out in various ways. And I don't know if that answers the question, mm -hmm. but that would yes. that would say differentiate South Africa from Zimbabwe, where the public sculptures of Cecil Rhodes, one in Salis what was Salisbury, Harari and one in Bulawayo were removed systematically after independence. So they were removed in 1881 and uh, relocated to places where you, you could, in theory, get to see them, but not necessarily. So the one in uh, Harare is located at the National Archives, which isn't completely open. It's kind of a, you'd have to kind of make an appointment to see it. The other one is at the back of a museum in Bulawayo, where you'd sort of have to kind of know it's there to go and look for it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's a different kind of approach mm -hmm. um, that's been taken. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what we could also see, I think, in your presentation as well, in Christina's presentation, is is this uh, uh, the kind of uh, counter monument, which is an idea that that's often at play? You know, I think if you cannot remove it, if you cannot destroy it, if the thing 
sometimes it's too big even yeah <laughs> like there's a there's a, a nazi sculpture in hamburg that was just so mm -hmm. so big that they couldn't destroy it somehow uh at least not really in the 50s and 60s and then the city commissioned a counter movement uh a counter um sculpture yeah yeah it's, uh, it's an interesting concept sometimes it's a bit helpless but we've seen specifically in in brenda in your presentation uh, also different moments of uh you know kind of um counter sculptures not necessarily by artists yeah but also for example by the mining by by people who are in solidarity with the mining families it's not necessarily a sculpture but i mean it, but also it is yeah. a photo of a family yeah it's clearly a visual intervention on on the very thing yeah, yeah. and i i think to look at these uh ma material places as as contested displays where in a decolonial process the different effects and energies need to play out yeah uh, where the negotiation the the poisonous the evil negotiation maybe but as long as the thing is there there is this relationship yeah so i think it's interesting to 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 see the possibility and the real activity how people try to 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 hijack to hack this themselves into this relationship in order to make a symbolic shift in it i think this is yeah this is what i found interesting in both of your lectures and what i what i learned from you today i think um yeah i'm not supposed i'm not i don't know if i'm supposed to say anything more uh, if if you if you if you want to and otherwise we can move to um Maybe one last thing. Maybe yeah. one last thing, because uh, um, you mo most of you might not know this this new patron thing that I work with. So I'm part of the international network of mediators that support co citizens in commissioning art. I think this is one reason why I'm here. <laughs> uh, so there are a couple of monuments that were actually commissioned by citizens, and it's quite interesting what the issues of these people are. Yeah? One of my favorite projects uh, out of really dozens of citizen commissioned monuments was one that was commissioned by the mother of a young man who was killed in the Bataclan during the terror attacks in Paris. And she, as the mother, stood one day in front of Picasso's Guernica in Madrid and she wrote a letter to Macron and said, we need a Guernica for the victims of the terror attacks in Paris. And Macron obviously didn't know what to do with such a, a demand. So it ended up in the hands of my colleagues in France, the mediators of the Nouveau Commanditaire, new patrons. And uh, they contacted this woman and ultimately she commissioned a contemporary famous contemporary composer who's no known name I've forgotten but then the it was the inauguration of the piece was in the Paris Philharmonie with the Paris uh, Chamber Orchestra live streamed on Arte so I'm I, I found it amazing if we if we start to try to think what individual citizens actually would do if we gave them the resources you know, to, to become part of this, in, in our case here, renegotiation process, I guess, yeah, or creation of counter narratives or new narratives or just own narratives, whatever, you know. Uh, of, of course, it's great that artists do this work. And in both examples, we could see that typically it's artists who go against these artworks to make a change about it, yeah. Uh, but we also know that a lot of people that are not artists share the same uh, effect sensitivity to this type of public symbols, yeah? but typically don't have a possibility to really do something about it. And I, what my, my inspiration I want to bring in at the end of my talk is that there are actually ways to give people that are not part of our art bubble or academic bubble or activists already you know, but maybe mothered or mothers of 
killed children, you know, to give them the condition, the resources, the possibilities to also be part of the creation of monuments and, and new narratives, public narratives. So that's my, that's maybe my, my point. For anybody who's interested, if you Google new patrons in French, nouveau commanditaire, in German, neuer Auftraggeber, you would find information. Okay, wonderful, thank you, Alexander. Maybe we can, well, afterwards um, have a broader discussion. First, I will give the floor to um, Dmitry Vilensky, who was born in Leningrad and is an artist, educator, and cultural environmentalist. He is also a core member of Stodelat, the art collective founded in 2003 in St. Petersburg. And Stodelat means what is to be done. Uh, it's the title of a novel and of a pamphlet by Lenin uh, from 1902. And its aim of the art collective is to um, integrate political theory, art, and activism. And I'm uh, well giving the floor to um, Dimitri. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And actually, also very important to mark my position as a speaker because we work as a collective a lot with the topic of monumentality and transformation of monumentality, doing actually archives of this transformation, categorizing it, like making indexes. So I was not sure if I can have a chance here to go deeper. I have actually quite about two hours lecture in particular, focus on different cases. But today, I really would like to maybe relate more to um, Christina um, um, issue and also maybe raise a general conversation about what is meaning of the colonial, because I think the situation when people in South Africa speaking of colonial heritage, of colonial violence, we then we stay in that kind of clear paradigm when it was actually clear in your statement what is the colonial, it's actually getting rid of that kind of Western toxic impact on local lives of different countries and different continents. But in the case of Estonia and post-Soviet space, I think the situation becomes more complicated and we can't simply transfer or translate that very sophisticated models which were developed in UK or Spanish type of colonization. Of course, there are so many even tiny um, logistical difference because sea colonization very different from land colonization. You know how it was structured historically. So we have to be really um, seriously concerned because right now I see how often this um, not really thought through and many things are trying to depict situation, but at the same time, when you will look from inside, it's very incorrect picture. So for us, it was also very important to combine uh, discussion or analysis of post-socialist or post-communist or post-socialist condition with the concept of imperialism, and anti-colonial movements and post-colonials and anti-decolonial um, situation. And from my point of view, it's very interesting overlap. You can particularly see in the work of young schoolers coming from that region. And actually, Christina tackled it in a very nice way. And actually, that's why I love your project and think that it was really very crucial and very brave to speak from that kind of Estonian position and really problematize these things that the colonial kind of equal to decommunization. Like if you go to Ukraine, to Georgia, to other places, they, and particularly if you speak in a framework of cultural kind of mindset or discourses, then they really equal decolonial, what get rid of 
colonization means get rid of any Soviet past. And then they also lose that kind of historical dialectical thinking. Of course, that confrontation between Nazi Germany and Stalin Russia and occupation of Pribaltica was very dramatic and tragic process. And actually what I like about Christina is that she brings that kind of haunting past. So you can, you can get rid of monuments, which usually non-visible because they stay there for centuries, you know, but at the same time, you can't simply get rid of the past. The past is haunting, that's why the ghost of that sculpture, which reappear in the middle of the ritual, because the sculptures, they survive only through the ritual. As no ritual, sometimes state make parades, you know, to celebrate some kind of Independence Day or whatever, you know, but activists doing their own ritual because also destruction of the monuments, it was always kind of performative action, which also through the repetition becomes that kind of ritualistic things, which was super important in deconstructing that violence of the memory through the violence of the action. So I think we should really be very careful and also sometimes when we discuss, but maybe I'm a little bit speaking from another perspective because sometimes mm, the monuments which celebrate certain kind of historical figures, so they erected not because they have a slaves, for example, all Russian aristocracy in 19th century, they have slaves. And Lev Tolstoy, for example, you know, <laughs> Alexander Pushkin. But the monuments which present on the cities of Russia or the next Soviet Union um, celebrate them not because they were slave owner. You know, they were celebrated for something else. And of course, we should and must criticize that kind of current you know, past condition, which was really right now looks so terrible. But at the same time, we also, I think we sometimes a little bit lack of that historical dimension, what is not acceptable today, and it's great progress of humanity, you know, was quite normal before. So you sometimes it's even ridiculous things that even in 19th century, when people use the word colonial, they meant something positive. You know, right now it's impossible to imagine that when, you know, Jewish people was trying to go to Palestine and talking about colonization, they talk about something super positive and progressive things, not for just for them, for humanity, you know. That was kind of position of kind of Western mindset of progressivism. And I think we should keep it in mind and also deal with that kind of historical complexity. Also, I think it also makes sense to mention that, um, uh, so I'm checking my points. Um, also, sometimes right now, you know, we live in that situation of emotional tone where it's hard to, get together rational debate, like kind of public sphere, what should stay, why sh what should go, in which way it should go. You know, so many ways, as Alexander mentioned, and many activists, it's not about destruction or removable of the statues. You know, sometimes it's about um, inclusion of different plaques, which introduce alternative versions of the histories of the hero who is represent, presented. And I think in the very case, and also Alexander mentioned one uh, monument in Hamburg. Actually, I'm in Hamburg right now, <laughs> so <laughs> where I live. And actually, it's a monument which was built after First World War, like a typical monument to that kind of unknown soldier. But at the same time, it became a place of rituals during Nazi time. And then it was considered as a kind of Nazi landmark, but it was actually realized a little bit, maybe five years before end of 20s. But then it was mainly protest action. It was repainted, you know, packed like Christo in white, you know, people rename it as a monument to desert here and so on and so on. But then they 
government and actually also maybe public opinion decided that monuments stay, but right now it's three more monuments around. One monument to desert here, one monument but Hrvilka, to kind of victims of the war. And all together it become kind of complex ensemble, which really trigger your thinking, okay, what's that? How it could be people do such stupid things, actually aesthetically, you know, because actually monument, it's not just dedicated to someone. It has definite aesthetic features, which represent the epoch. And actually, we should be really also very careful with that kind of intervention. Or we create a new, like in many countries, which through the process of decommunization, because, you know, it was bench of heaps of monuments on the streets, they put in them so-called sculpture parts. And then you can see 20 Lenin together with Stalin, together with Pioneer, with some dogs, some innocent sculpture. And it's quite, it, 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 it makes sense because you really uh, recompose into some kind of new ensemble, which also speak to you in relation to the past and your comprehension of processes what brought them together. It also comes with interpretation. And here, maybe if you don't mind, I'll show you one example of our piece because maybe because you are into that topic and I guess it's easy because it's on our website. And I think it would be interesting for Christina to, I'm not sure, How, can you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see it. It was a project 2014 face to face with monument and it was somehow inspired by Christina. <laughs> so it was big public art project. Um, yeah, see it's architecture rendering. So yeah, it's really it's Schwarzenberger Platz where the biggest Soviet sculpture is staying. So you see here that original historical monument, and this is our construction. So we make actually one month festival dedicated to <laughs> dedicated to rethinking what is monumentality. And we call it face to face with monument. I can show you a few pictures. And actually we also placed a paper replica of this culture in front of them. But at the same time, it was not direct replica. It was kind of, we call it queer paper soldier. So I can maybe start to show. To remember means to fight. You see they're face to face to each other, you know? <laughs> it's quite big, you know? And then we put it anti-fascist because, you know, it was for us was rethinking because um, Russian government used the rhetoric of anti-fascism in super ugly, phony, profanate way. And we actually was trying to discuss what means anti-fascism today. And actually we place, you can see that kind of stuff and actually classical gesture of German communists. Because you know, when you talk about um, decommunization, also there is another equality because in context of post-Soviet um, situation, it's very often means that decommunization means derussification. It's something like it was never Latvian or Estonian communist or Uzbek communist. It was really like something imported, like colonial kind of communist coming. And here we really at the edge of very dangerous speculation because it's very much reminds that kind of situation with position of the Jews, you know, that Jews kind of internal, you know, external internal enemy which really poisons society but at the same time the healthy spirit of the nation can get rid of that kind of scum you know and also ignoring that actually that history of the communism is much more deep and it's also international it has certain relation to russia because actually the same rhetoric of russian anti-communism right now russian nationalism the same similar you can see it in uzbekistan in Georgia, in Ukraine, in this Latvia, everywhere. So, <clears throat> yeah, here you see, dear paper soldier, what we'll do with anti-fascism today. Mm, so it was night programs, it was many concerts in this Duniak installation, because we have also big, uh, how to say, uh, poster place uh, where it's about, I think it's about five meters, something like that. So, um, 
this is a guy, oh, it's a very famous guy who make antimony uh, holds, I guess. Oh, sorry, I forgot his name. Mm, so face to face. Oh, Gvatari Spivak <laughs> visiting us. And Schwabingrad Ballet from Hamburg was Lampedusa migrant made amazing performance and concert. Mm. Actually, the poster was changing every week, and this uh, you see it's from Irving Collective. So, yeah. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Ah, it's a partisan choir from Ljubljana. So it was amazing. We have events almost every um, every day. So maybe I'll finish here. And actually, thank you so much. I'm super happy to see all of you, and especially Christina for bringing that memories and yeah, inspiration. And we keep working because I think it's really one of the key topic right now. And when Black Lives Matter started their campaign, so dismantling statues that the discourse have new waves and new waves, you know, because our project was done actually during that 2014, shortly after outbreak of Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea. And for us, it was also very important to reflect on it. And actually in this, oh, sorry, maybe I'll jump back because there is one very interesting publication. Let me check how to return to it. Just go, oh, ah, yeah. So yeah, here we make a publication face to face to the monument where you can actually see all kind of um, cards about, ah, you see actually <laughs> here <laughs> immediately on the second page, the bronze soldier talents case after Van Damme Cologne. So yeah, and this is our project. Yeah, um, Sanya Vekovic. Um, uh, do, 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 do the CNN rating the ugliest monument. So yeah, so I really recommend it's all of them free to download so you can just use it for your seminars, whatever. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri. Um, Christina, do you want to have got any? Reaction? Yes, I just wanted to maybe comment that, that uh... It's indeed in Estonia, uh, somehow this uh, post um, uh, Soviet identities uh, or this Soviet experience uh, is uh, considered the, the, the history uh, everyone is uh, sort of processing in the society. Uh, and um, maybe also this uh, notion of uh, decolonization is is a bit conf like is perceived as confusing in Estonia because there is also this uh, um, ideas about uh, Estonians being being European or somehow this uh, Europeanness as the prime kind of definition of identity. Um, it sort of uh, um, also. Um, does not allow Estonians to to think of of their historical experience as um, a, um, colonial, uh, and even uh, this um, because somehow this uh, narr like narratives about colonialism are so strongly affected by. Uh, Western colonial history and history telling and historical narratives that Estonians find it hard to find their place within this. And also there is this question of whiteness, uh, definitely that is very important uh, in, uh, in finding a, a way to relate to the history because Estonian, uh, of course, uh, uh, consider themselves uh, too white to be colonized or too, uh, too, <laughs> to be colonial subjects. But also 
when uh, when we look back uh, in the history of the Russian Empire, when Estonian territories were part of this uh, imperial context, then uh, it is enough to look at these um, uh, scientific representations of Estonians and Latvians uh, uh, in uh, zoological studies um, uh, of the R Russian imperial scientists. So uh, it is very, uh, it is a very, it could be a very interesting case uh, for everyone to look into this history uh, of the colonization uh, by um, the Russian empire of the smaller um, ethnicities um, um, uh, in Siberia and also in the European territories and, and what were these narratives uh, uh, about this, uh, this, uh, this um, um, uh, groups of people um, uh, subjected to the imperial Russian imperial power. So, um, and it is also helpful, uh, maybe, uh, to under to, um, or it can contribute into this uh, study of how uh, the notion of race is uh, being constructed. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's this very uh, very complicated um, uh, history, and also I think uh, uh, Dima, for you as well, uh, maybe uh, is a good idea to a little bit explore uh, that history uh, or the history of the Russian Empire from that perspective of uh, how how this uh, history of um, of uh, or Russian colonial history or like you said uh, the the land colonization. And um, maybe you can make um, interesting art projects about that because it really relates to contemporary situation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, the war in Ukraine, and uh, for us to, for everyone to understand how imperialism uh, works, and uh, how, for instance, we have nowadays uh, so many um, people. Um, uh, mobile, mobilized into the Russian uh, Russian army and sent to uh, Ukraine, uh, and these people are from these indigenous uh, populations that uh, that were once uh, colonized by Russia. And this mm -hmm. is actually a topic that is very interesting for me nowadays because I I really uh, want to explore this. Um, uh these uh, different subject positions that uh, that we can or uh, choose from or that we can imagine in this situation uh or even looking at the soviet history because uh, this notion of collaborationism is very important and also in the russian imperial times for instance when when uh, russia uh, was using uh, um or instrumentalizing uh people from the um from the baltics uh, to uh, uh in the project of uh, uh, colonization of crimea for instance so this would be a uh, baltic german um noble men uh, uh, who were leading these uh, military operations to um uh, uh, to cleanse ethnically cleanse uh, the uh, Crimea, uh, Crimea, but also the uh, Ca uh, Caucasus, and um, and then uh, Estonian and uh, and Latvian peasants uh, would uh, uh, would uh, would be uh, invited to uh, uh, repopulate the abandoned houses uh, of uh, Crimean Tatars and um, and uh, Cherkess people. Um, um, in um, Caucasia, for instance, and in the Soviet time, uh, there were also Estonian uh, Estonian um, uh, conscripts uh, who were sent to the Soviet war in Afghanistan. So these histories of violence and uh, this uh, entanglement of 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 um, um, uh these histories uh, are is is very um, is very interesting to look at uh now um at the background of the uh, Uk w russia's war in ukraine to understand current processes and also to explain how how this violence actually works yeah so it's uh 
complicated. I don't know. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I think uh, the last uh, Estonian pavilion which you did with Karina exactly. also. Exactly. Yeah. I think that also tackle a lot of the internal issues related to Estonian ambivalent situation and the global division of global division of colonialism, if we can say it. Yeah. yeah, but back to your question, I think it also that lineage from Russian Empire to Soviet Union. Sometimes they take it for granted that it's kind of smooth, that kind of came Russian Soviet Revolution, and then empire was kind of reappear again. It lost Poland, it lost Baltic Republic, it lost Finland, but at the same time, configuration was more or less the same. I'm a little bit how to say skeptical. I think that it was kind of striking similarities yes sure but at the same time the demons always in details you know and actually i think it was actually a radical break which completely reconfigured that, that also we should talk about that what is how we treat right now that concept of modernization and modernity kind of you know that forced modernization which was done by soviet power in the territory of soviet union it was quite unique. So, you know, elimination of illiteracy and many other stuff, emancipation of female bodies, you know, actually for more than 20 years, Soviet Union have the most kind of progressive gender uh, in legislation, you know, acceptance of gay marriage, not marriage, but gay relationship, abor right to abortion, and so on and so on. It was quite radical. And of course, it created very strong conflict with the kind of national form of life and particular middle asian so on <clears throat> so i think we should go far with this for a few more hours <laughs> and i'm not sure that <laughs> we can really but what i really wanted to say that for me right now disturbing that particular um, schoolers from this region become super non-sensitive to that differences and looks like they got very good education in somewhere in us or uk or in germany and then kind of start to repeat that the colonial not as a kind of creative provocative and inspiring thinking but as a kind of doxa and also we have a quite serious problem with whatever we call campism you know, like Mignola, Walter Mignola, how you pronounce it, that the classic, yeah, you know, who openly support Putin as kind of decolonial manifestation, you know. And actually, a lot of people from the decolonial kind of circle, intellectuals, researchers, too many, unfortunately, of them really consider that this kind of Lula in Brazil, you know, celebrating Putin as a kind of decolonial movement. And also Putin used decolonial rhetoric in his speeches. And that brings us to a new wave of something went a little bit wrong. <laughs> it was really worked pretty well somehow, but at the moment we in a period of serious, how to say, reconsideration. What is Global South? What is the differences in Global South? whom belong, and also if anything which comes from global south is progressive, you know, Russia included, Iran or China. Thank you. So I stop yeah. here because it's, I, I love this topic, but I'm trying to write right now about it, but it's so complicated. Uh, thank it just, you. Uh, uh, sounds, uh, yeah. Um, hey, I just wanted to shortly comment that uh, uh, really from your um, presentation of the the, so, the Soviet uh, modernity is uh, it, one can uh, get this idea um, or misperception uh, of the of the Soviet uh, of the entire Soviet period as this very very progressive uh, and uh, uh, beautiful utopia but uh, all no, these things that you are saying all. about uh, uh, it's just that we need to be very um, uh, and also, actually, the project, my project after war, um, 
is is exactly trying to uh, also show that um, through this very monument case or uh, through this uh, exploration of all this archival material uh, to show how how this uh, Soviet period has never been um, heterogen or like homogeneous that uh, there were all these eras that uh, exchanged one another and uh, all these ideas about modernity were changing constantly and also, uh, by the time when Estonia was incorporated into the Soviet uh, Union, um, uh, all these uh, ideas about uh, um, women's um, uh, liberties and, uh, and 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 gay liberties and all that they they had well the, the, they had vanished uh, uh, from the Soviet um, um, kind of um, imaginary. So. Uh, um, yeah, so we nowadays we have uh, artists like Janusz Sama, for instance, who is exploring exactly the gay history and um, as a as this kind of history of repression uh, yeah, in, and... in the Soviet period. Uh, and uh, there are PhDs written about uh, about these particular cases uh, in Estonia. So this history has been researched in Estonia very well. Uh, by now, and uh, we know that uh, what you were just saying about um, about uh, these utopian utopian uh, liberties uh, doesn't doesn't really apply to the Christina, Estonian experience. I said it only for, I I'm mentioned sorry. only ten years after revolution. That's it. No. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Estonia was far away from that period. <laughs> okay, okay, and those you... are also sorry. quite problematic. Sorry, I I have to. Um, yes, so, yes. I mean, it's a very interesting, but there are more people and we have a lot of other audience people also want to contribute or have questions. Uh, I saw a question of uh, Nidafur, um to Brenda. We'll, I'll get back to her. And first, of, well, just a very short, please, comment of uh, Alexander Koch, who has also something to say. And then... Yes, thank you. Because while I was listening now, it uh, it came to my mind that there's something that I find important in our context that was not yet mentioned, which is the notion of conflict. Because these uh, uh, everything that we were looking at here in terms of artwork and uh, activities around them uh, produces conflict, represents conflict, has a conflict, etc. And the what what. <clears throat> what I'm working on since since years kind of is to bring forward how important conflict is for democratic cultures and societies. And in Germany, it has been a bit forgotten because people here believe that democracy means consensus. No, democracy starts with the ever existing conflict that people have with each other. Democracy is then just one way how we can deal with conflicts. Yeah, And it's amazing. And what we need in order to be able to deal with our conflicts that are there in any case, for that we need like playgrounds, we need uh, 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 opportunities. And the interesting thing is that these public sculptures have such a big effective dimension to many people that they often become the reason or the playground or the display for for negotiating conflicts that otherwise might not be acted out. Yeah. So there was an interesting remark that I could also confirm, like in the in the chat, like, why is it interesting to produce physical monuments? Like, is that a good idea to advocate for the production of new monuments? Yes, no, it's not my issue. But the issue is, though, what is there in the material world that appeals to the effect of many different people? Yeah. Um, is, is an issue of conflictualization that's available for us. And that makes these sites and these objects precious somehow for the societal communication process, violent or nonviolent. I just wanted to put that into our, our, <laughs> in our, yeah. into our debate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is very, well, yeah, it's very relevant also. I mean, in a way you could say perhaps that, you know, are these then, are they artworks or are there, you know, there are the sculptures are political statements which are commented to by artworks or are there new mm -hmm. political statements or is it a combination of the two? But in a, I think indeed we are all, well, also material 
I mean, you want to, it's, it's easier to talk when you have an image or something to talk about than just some well, um, abstract ideas which you don't disagree, don't agree about. Oh, that's the thing. I'm sorry, Jorge. Yeah. That's exactly the thing. There are no yeah. abstract ideas. No, no, no. There are, uh, are only, <laughs> you know, representations yeah. in the real world that's in front of us. And typically that we can knock on. Okay, now there's a... Yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah, something yeah. to knock on that you can destroy if necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Nilafor, you have uh, had a remark. Uh, um. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask Brenda, actually, because I saw her very interesting presentation, you know, the visuals were, you know, sort of spanned, uh, you know, I think almost two decades, if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to know the relationship between this knowledge that has been generated through her research and her courses, because Brenda is an educator, an art educator. So how do you integrate the two? Uh, because this is all contemporary art history. So how is that taught? And if it is at all in courses and uh, institutionalized uh, in you know publications, which are widely read, or are there any debates on the campus? You know, what is this intervention doing in terms of uh, inspiring people or telling them how to resolve issues of the presence of these, uh, you know, major you know let's say unwanted sculpture or monuments um in terms of my own history um i was a general lecturer up to 2013 at the moment and since i've been at the university of johannesburg my role has really been to supervise postgraduate students so as a, in my previous incarnation, I did two courses in public art. And I would try and pick up contentious areas and ask students to debate them. I'm not sure whether how much that happens now. I've got a couple of postgraduates, master's students who are working with the politics of public art. One of them, a practitioner, is looking to produce a participative public art piece in Pretoria at the moment. Um, she's interested in the idea of a sort of immediate engagement art, the public art piece that people respond to with immediacy and what that means. Another one of my master's students is interested in the idea of what do you do with colonial monuments. It's come up with this really rather wonderful idea. It's focused on the public sculptures of Queen Victoria. And he's decided that they should all be repatriated to Britain. And he's producing paintings. Which of course, it's obviously an impossibility um, playing with that idea satirically. Oh, so, so I guess these ideas do filter through down um, in education in one form or another. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Thank you for it. Thank you. Can I, can I butt in for one minute there? Just in terms of, of um, the discourse on public art, Brenda, actually has published a lot on that. I mean, she's being very modest here, not saying it, but, mm -hmm. but she's put books together with, with a range of other people's texts on it, and she's published herself, and she's also involved in a, um, a publication on public art. I've forgotten what it's called, Brenda. Um, I remember because it is a public art dialogue. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... so there's there is Brenda isn't very involved in um kind of raising the awareness of people to this kind of debate. Although she might not be doing it directly in the university. She's yeah, doing it on a wider platform. Yeah. It's a much wider platform amongst academics mostly. Um I don't, I'm not sure if 
Landy Raubenheimer is still there and who commented and maybe wants to repeat the question for hi uh, yes. yes i am i've just lost sight of my screen i'm working across two or looking at two different screens so you're going to see the side of my face until i can move this just give me one second um <laughs> sorry about that my question well maybe i'll just ask it i don't want to i don't want to waste time um but my it was really more of a comment than a question it was just interesting to me um you know i'm more or less familiar with with this debate in a south african context and with with the sort of developments around public art especially from this activist point of view but i was interested in how this sort of opportunistic um vandalism seems to have extended the life of this conversation in an interesting way and i was it really just came to mind that i wonder whether there's a way in which artists could prompt you know something that's a an extended engagement um even if it if it leaves the realm of pure activism or even if it starts having a different effect what's interesting to me is just that it gives a real life um to public artworks and it is ironic i suppose that it's artworks that now perhaps most people don't want around um but often public art can be quite overlooked so i thought that that was an interesting sort of aspect of it it's not really a question it's just something that i was thinking about can i respond with a sort of paradox um i didn't mention it in the paper um, i made a trip to kimberley last month um january i suddenly noticed that the cecil road sculpture there as well as the honored dead memorial which is a thing to the siege of Kimberley during the South African War. They've both been sort of suddenly overlaid with um, graffiti. <clears throat> Not a kind of particularly intentionalist graffiti, but it's almost a meaningful in a way in that it speaks to poverty. And because the graffiti is often accompanied by signs of people sleeping out at those spaces to get shelter. Um, and it speaks also poignantly of the irrelevance of those monuments to those people. So even sort of indirect graffiti can speak so strongly of something and it is interesting also how it's escalated in the last year it's almost like there's been maybe an escalation of poverty there because really not wealthy the northern cape and i was kind of interested in that sudden response there was an attempt on the part of the municipality at one stage to fence off the monuments they started with the Cecil Roads. It was never achieved particularly successfully, but it was almost like to keep out um, the homeless. And that's kind of been given up on as a process. Um, so I think even those kinds of things can speak quite resonantly along with the more motivated expressions by artists. I did like Alexandra's comment, Alexandra's comment about monuments being about conflict. And I was interested and I was thinking maybe the test of democracy is a capacity of a society to tolerate an alternative viewpoint imposed on that monument without the impetus to remove it mm. immediately, to keep those sort of accretions and differences in place. And perhaps that's the sign that we will 
have arrived at something democratic when that becomes possible. When the impetus isn't to clean away the illegal um, component. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Brenda. And, and maybe Marjorie, um, you, you, uh, Marjorie, um, had a comment in the chat. Um, do you want to? Yes. Again? Yeah. Yeah. I clearly, apart from the uh, interventions on existing monuments, which are politically very contentious, um, and the mood, the mode, or the um, a need to be more democratic in how um, art is commissioned. I'm very nervous of supporting any production of in a traditional sculptural language, which I think embodies so much freighted history. And there's still of that going on, you know, around um, in my own experience when I was dealing with. Um, in Britain, we had the lottery, which released squillions of uh, funds, which were used democratically around the country, involving the communities to commission their own work through local regional authorities. And in some cases, this was, uh, it resulted in very big funds spent on works which are dubious as artworks, uh, even to um, the untutored eye, as it were. Um, and uh, it simply creates more clutter in the world, <laughs> which is going to be contested in the future. So um, I really um, support artists. I mean, Dimitri's presentation with the wonderful counter monumental uh, performance and practice which work which undermines and undercuts the public uh, and popular um, appetite for new statues and new monuments. I mean, we had one, i just give you one example. Um, we, we now have in some regional uh, city, a vast monument to the local firemen, who of course are heroes in many respects, but who wants to see great bronze firemen cluttering up the city, you know, and there are many other cases like that, where people want to adopt heroes of their own. But um, in the end, we have much more exciting ways of uh, memorizing and, com and commemorating uh, contemporary narratives using new technologies and new visual languages. And, um, and I wholly support artists working in those fields. So that was my point, Liam. We need no more statues. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie. Yeah, I don't know. Is Christina or, or Alexander, do you want to comment on that? I mean, Christina, you obviously, you don't build actually really, no, you don't make new statues, right? You, you kind of fits in no, this. No, 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 I absolutely agree with this. Uh uh with this comment and uh also uh, with this temporary monuments or uh this kind of uh ephemeral uh presences in uh in public um instead of uh uh yeah uh, making building uh monuments that uh that of course are outdated uh, by the very <laughs> by the very corporality of these uh, mm -hmm. of these objects in public space, and also they they are like of they can always become vulnerable, like the the points of vulnerability or the kind of the uh, they're too easy to uh, to attack, and uh, I think this is um, yeah I think there should be. Uh, there should be other other ways to um, to deal with um, uh, with with memory and um, and uh, provide um, different frames to uh, uh, to include more people into um, uh, to to discussions and um, and find different grounds for building solidarity within the society. Yeah, yeah, I, I was. I was very curious about what Alexander. I, I could say two, two things. One is um, uh, it's a, a 
I find it not correct to disqualify citizen commission art per se. I know the field pretty well. I know that there are a lot of shitty projects around, <laughs> also internationally. But uh, this is a lot about methodology. Like what what yeah. are the very methodologies of citizen commission art and what, what are the potential qualities or, or shit that comes out of that? Yeah. So there, there, there's nothing general that you can say against it, I want to say. Um, and the other thing is, I'm really not keen on, on more monuments or, or, or material production of artworks that's not, that would not be my debate. As a matter of fact, for now, we still have a lot of material production of artworks. And this is where I would like to step in and say, how, what are the conditions of this production? Who decides on them? And what, what language do they speak? Whose language do they speak? Yeah. And just one sector that we can all find really ridiculous, but that's that's which of resources is um, Kunst am Bau, you know, art in 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 uh, architecture, like this one percent schemes in in some countries, you know. And we all know how bad these projects typically are. Yeah, uh, but actually the money is there. Sometimes it's even in the law. So we should be thankful that there are one percent <laughs> out of the budget for a new airport available for art. The question is, what do we do with it in a meaningful way? Because as long as I hold the position, and I would like to hold that, that art is important for the society, we have to ask for where it's meaningful produced and for whom and by whom. And the answer cannot be, let's forget the material part of this production and let's go into immaterial performative thing. That's not enough. That's not enough of an answer for such complex thing as cultural production is. No, I'm yeah. also happy to answer that question as well, if you can. I mean, it's one of my hobby horses, and one of my big things, um, concerns, let's say, is that the, the in a democratic South Africa, there's often been an assumption that one simply takes a different range of people and one makes exactly the same kinds of sculptures about them. So we have these monstrous, conservative, appalling sculptures of Nelson Mandela littered across South Africa. We have a couple that are sort of radical and rework the language. But I think it's really important to understand that this is around decolonization. And it's not normally, I find in my context, grasped is that the language of decolonization is not simply a different range of people or events being commemorated. It's the very language of public art that needs to shift and change. Um, and it's an important point. Um, in South Africa, it's not one that's widely grasped. Which is, I think, why we've also got this sort of monstrous things that are happening in the UK. You okay? You're muted. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, Titiayo Adebayo has perhaps um, also a comment. It's been... Um... Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're okay. in the chat. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Titi Laya. I'm from University of Lagos. Uh, I'm a scholar in um, comparative theater history, performance aesthetics, and then technology. So I'm very happy to be here today listening to the presenters and all the um, contributions. And like I've written, I'm particularly very, uh, you know, happy that the global discourse is gradually coming back to the issue of, um, you know, uh, global politics in the, uh, in terms of how our public spaces and monuments were created, currently being experienced, and um, um, the desire for future you know, projections. 
um, uh, I, I did a kind of a comparative uh, analysis on uh, um, theater history in uh, Southeast Europe and Nigeria. And I was in Bulgaria briefly, you know, because uh, towards the post-independence period after colonialism, Nigeria was also a beneficiary of the context between the West and, uh, you know, and, uh, and South U Russia in trying to determine how our arts, public monuments, architectures, and other public spaces were, would be developed. And uh, in fact, our national theater in Nigeria, the biggest theater in Nigeria was built as the giant replica of the Bulgarian Palace of Culture and Sports in Vrana, you know? So over the years, the building has become a contested space in Nigerian social cultural development. And that is what my PhD thesis was all about. And it was with regards to my thesis, I was actually able to find out that, you know, uh, there was a bit of imperialistic tendencies in the, in the Russia attempts to dominate the world. Because, you know, in this part of the continent, imperialism and dominance has always been like, seen like something that is, you know, left to the European countries and the, you know, America and the rest. And um, because Russia never really held a colony in Africa, you know, directly like that, most African always perceive, you know, oh, the, you know, Russia is our friend, is our this and that. And um, it took my research to find out that there was a whole lot going on in Southeast Europe, Eastern Europe, and, uh, you know, that shared the dynamics of the world during the post uh, Second War period. And, uh, you know, listening to the presenters, you know, the, especially the second presenters about the, uh, you know, some of the challenges, the conflicts, the contestations about monuments, uh, you know, and the issue of colonialism. Should, you know, in Bulgaria, they also didn't call it colonialism. They, call, they, they perceive the Turkey as an invasion rather than a colonialism. So the question I, I've always wanted to ask is invasion and colonialism, what's the difference? You know, because over the years, sometimes the, I mean, the, the, the line can be very thin in terms of the effect. Like most of um, Bulgarian public spaces, monuments were highly influenced by the same Russian, you know, interactions. So and I, I enjoyed listening to both presenters about what the history of imperialism has shaped, you know, how it has shaped our global identities. You know, it makes me realize as an African that we were not the only one that were affected, you know, by the issues of the pre-Second World War and the post-Second World War, and even presently with the uh, Russia-Ukraine war and the, and you know, the ongoing uh, conflict. So I'm happy to be here. I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm looking forward to more interactions. Uh, you know, thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you. No, oh, thank you uh, as well. I mean, you also show that the. I mean, although my one might think these two, you know, the the the, the story of of Christina's work and the the topic of the Rhodes Monument might be very far apart, but well, the, there are also a lot of well connections made to be made, and you showed um, with this the story of the theater, which is a uh, well. Very incredible, um, well, idea and, and also topic to, to, I think, also to end with. Um, yes, so I want to thank everybody, especially the, the speakers, but also all the um, people who were present uh, for their, um, well, for their contributions and for their time. And, um, well, hopefully we will see you all uh, next time with the next um, seminar. Um, and, um, well, we hope to keep in contact and, um, wish you a pleasant day and, um, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. All the speakers, in fact. Yes. Okay.
Bye. Bye.